What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. I am Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. Everything 2019 fantasy football to help you prep for your draft and for the season. We're going to help you bring home the chip this year, baby. Today, we're talking about running backs that you do not want to draft. Players to avoid. Running backs to avoid, more particularly. In 2019 fantasy football, we've been talking a lot about players to target earlier on this week. We hit on uh, must-own running backs. If you missed that on Wednesday, go check that out. We did an updated version of that. But today, we're going to be talking about guys that you want to stay away from. The herpes of the fantasy football season. As always, if y'all enjoy the video, all I ask is that you hit that thumbs up button down below. It takes you two seconds, lets you know that you appreciate the big facts and the work that I put into these videos. Subscribe to the channel if you are new, because we are going to be helping you throughout the entire 2019 fantasy football season, baby. So let's get cracking. Draft guide giveaway question of the day. If you are unfamiliar with the channel, we created a draft guide on bigdogsdraftguide.com, which is encapsulating everything you need for your 2019 fantasy football draft. I would highly recommend you go check that out. You literally don't need to look elsewhere. It's got the rankings, the sleepers, the busts, the must-own players, along with a ton of other shit in there. So go check it out. But we will be giving away one draft guide per episode leading up to the season. The winner of this week's episode will be announced next Saturday. The question I have for you, knowing what we know now between Miles Sanders, David Montgomery, and Josh Jacobs, who is your rookie running back one? for redraft, for season long, not for dynasty. If you had to choose straight up, not according to value or ADP or whatever, one of those three running backs to own on your fantasy team this year, which one of Sanders, Montgomery, and Jacobs is it and why? You must drop some big facts along with your answer. If you do that in the comment section down below and hit the thumbs up button, you will automatically be entered into the draft guide giveaway. If not, go check it out on bigdogsdraftguide.com. Let's get into the video. First running back up on this list that you do not want to draft is Derrick Henry of the Tennessee Titans. Now, I slowly had Derrick Henry creeping up my rankings as the offseason went by, and I made this video, the same video, the Do Not Draft Players video back in like February or March, as soon as last season ended, and he was the first name I put on this list. I couldn't wait for people to get really excited about the hype based off of like the last four weeks of last year and start drafting him in the third, second round of this year, thinking he was going to be the all-purpose workhorse in this Tennessee offense. So he actually started creeping up my rankings as the summer went by. And I was like, you know what? Henry isn't actually the worst third round pick. You could even get him in the early fourth round in some drafts. I didn't love it given his role, but it is somewhat safe because the volume in terms of rushing was going to be there. The other thing was compared to the other players in that area of where he was getting drafted, he was not an injury risk until he was. Until he wound up in a walking boot a few weeks ago with a pretty severe calf strain um, because he missed pretty much an entire month of the Tennessee Titans practice and, and training camp. Now, he returned to practice earlier this week. On Monday, he finally returned to team drills. However, it still puts him at a much, much higher re-injury risk than other players who did not suffer a calf strain pull earlier on in the offseason. The calves naturally put you at a much higher risk in terms of these muscle strains, right? Hamstring and calf strains, a lot of time lead to compensation injuries. You look exactly at what happened to Jarek McKinnon last year. He was someone I was super high on. As soon as he pulled his calf in the beginning of August last year, I put him on my do not draft list. He was like a third rounder for me, probably too high to be honest. As soon as that happened, I said, do not draft this guy. This is going to cause problems. A few weeks later, they put him back onto the field and he tore his ACL. Boom, done for the season. As we know, Jarek McKinnon is now a sob story for fantasy football players. I'm not saying Derek Henry's going to tear his ACL, but there is a very high chance that he suffers some kind of re-injury risk, whether he sits out for the entire preseason and they don't run him at NFL speed for over a month and a half. That puts him at a higher re-injury risk for just throwing him back onto the field week one, week two for to see 25 carries. If they do throw him back onto the field too early, that is also a natural re-injury risk rating fucking razor. I don't even know what I'm trying to say anymore, but you get the point. It's a tricky situation, but like I always say, do not find injuries in fantasy football because they will find you. 
So on top of the cap, on top of the injury, which is a huge concern for me, we also have to look at the team. They're basically already in the middle of a quarterback controversy, and it's the second week of the preseason, right? The Titans starting quarterback job looks surprisingly wide open. Reports say that Mariota is on a short leash with Ryan Tannehill here. Tell yourself whatever you want. That's absolutely not a good thing, no matter who is under center. Mariota has looked like trash this preseason. I've watched all of the games. You can get all my preseason recaps and write-ups in the Big Dogs Draft Guide. Mariota is throwing the ball with zero zip. He looks hesitant. He does not look good out there. And I would not be surprised if Ryan, Ryan Tannehill makes, you know, six to eight starts during the 2019 season. And I think this offense is set up to plummet pretty big. And they're not going to have game scripts that favor Derrick Henry. And when you're Derrick Henry's, you know, skill set, who needs the 20 to 25 carries in order to succeed as a fantasy running back, especially return value on a third round pick that you're going to have to use on him. Um, you need really good game scripts for that. You're not going to be able to depend on him to catch passes. He is not a pass catching back. And I literally don't care what your subjective view about Derrick Henry's pass catching ability is because the guy had 17 receptions in 39 career college games and he has averaged 0.8 receptions per game during his 46 NFL games. He is not a pass catcher. However, Deion Lewis, who has been taking basically all the snaps with the one so far this preseason, is a very, very good pass catcher. Let's not play down what he did last year. The guy caught... 59 receptions in 2019. A very, very quiet number that is a very high number for a running back. And from weeks 14 to 17, which is when Henry ripped off that entire big, you know, stretch of games where he was running for 200 yards a game and whatnot, Deion Lewis caught 14 passes on 16 targets during those four games. If you pace that out to 16 games, that's still 56 receptions on like 65 targets. So it was the same pace. He was still the pass catching back in that offense. It was not like Derrick Henry took a three down roll while he was being productive. It was still Lewis as the pass catching guy. Henry is a guy that's super game script dependent that will eat if he scores touchdowns, but in an offense that you reasonably can't think is going to be very good. Vegas has them projected to win fewer than eight games this year. So they're supposed to be a losing team. How many games are they going to have dominant game scripts in which they could feed Henry the ball 25 times? And now on top of that, he has the higher re-injury risk rating because of the calf. I'm going to take a hard pass on Derrick Henry anywhere before the fifth round. And, you know, let's not even mention the fact that all of the hype on Henry is based off a three to four game sample size last year. It was over the last four weeks of the season where Henry was basically fresh on fresh legs because he barely played. He barely got touches over the first, you know, 14, 13 weeks of the season. And he's playing against these beat down defenses who have been playing all year. And the majority of those defenses were not playing for playoff spots. They were not fighting for anything. So you think those defenses are going to try really hard to tackle a 250 pound running back who's on fresh legs? That ain't going to happen. He didn't touch 60 rushing yards until week 14 last year. And he had multiple games of 18 carries leading up to that. And he couldn't hit 60 rushing yards. So let's not talk about that. But you're looking at Derrick Henry as a guy you're going to have to use a third round pick on who does not catch passes, who is not in a good offense, but is going to need to lean on really high rushing carry totals. But the game script is not going to let that happen, in my opinion. I don't think Tennessee is going to be very good this year. So I am passing on Derrick Henry anywhere in the early rounds of draft, especially with his calf injury. That is my do not draft player number one. If your leagues are rapidly approaching, which I assume they are, I think next weekend and the weekend after that are the most popularized draft weekends for fantasy football players. If you're in a league where you're the commissioner, I'm the commissioner of four or five leagues. I know you guys probably have friends who are the commissioners of your leagues, whether it's coworkers or family or, or actual friends. Um, shout out to y'all for having friends. I would love to know what that feels like. Here's what you're going to want to do. You're going to want to go over to teamstake.com and you could sign your league up on teamstake.com. This is a way that you can have all of your league buy-in payments in one neatly organized, customizable place. You don't have to run around collecting cash from your coworkers. You don't have to ask your family and friends for their PayPal and their Venmo. You don't have to keep track of all this stuff. It does that in a nicely neatly organized fashion and you can customize the buy-in prices late fees if you don't pay on time customizable payouts there are options for zero percent processing fees on both payouts and buy-ins you can have money roll over so if you have any special rules where it's like we have a side pot that goes to a team that goes undefeated or something and it doesn't happen for five years you can have money keep rolling over super customizable super easy the best part about it is literally once you set your league up all you got to do is copy the league url and send it over to your group chat or however you communicate with your league mates and it's that simple send them over the url they get in and they pay and you don't have to worry about the rest it tells you whether or not they paid already so no more chasing your league mates go sign your league up on teamstake.com i personally use it for all my leagues it is 
a blessing. So shout out to teamsake.com for sponsoring today's video. Let's talk about my second running back that you should not be drafting right now, and that is Kenyon Drake of the Miami Dolphins. He is currently running back 30 off the board, 72nd overall. Let's start with this, a stat that I tweeted out yesterday. People love talking about the fact that Kenyon Drake finished as the running back 14 in PPR last year overall. Now, I have a a lot to combat this with, but we'll keep it simple. This might be one of the most flawed stats I have come across in the history of me looking at fantasy football stats. And there has been a lot of stats that my mind has come across. First off, on a points per game basis, which is much more important than overall, he was the running back 19 in PPR. When you look at it from half PPR, he was the running back 22 among all running backs that played at least 10 games. So it's not like small sample sizes. He was running back 22, not running back 14. And do you remember that game where the Dolphins had a walk-off ridiculous lateral play where like nine players touched it and they scored a touchdown to beat the Patriots at the end of the game? Well, Kenyon Drake got credited for a 55-yard touchdown catch on that. If you take that out, which is obviously not predictable and will not be happening again in 2020, if you take out that lateral touchdown, Kenyon Drake winds up as the running back 30 last year on a points per game basis. So talk about your running back 14. He's a borderline RB1 last year. Realistically, he's more of a running back three last year, especially with the consistency he brought you. He had so many games where he'd go, you know, three touches, five touches, give you three fantasy points, and then have his explosion game, which he was not in your lineup for. So we're looking at big facts only here, not these fake news stats. Now, the more concerning part of Drake much to the similarity of Derrick Henry, is that he wound, he went wound up in a walking boot after practice last week. Brian Flores, their head coach, came out and already said it's going to take a while to heal. Now, you tell me something like that, any statement like that, at any time during mid-August, and that player is off my draft board. Don't find injuries. They will find your fantasy football team. I promise you that. You know, anytime you hear, this is going to take a while to heal, week to week, anytime during close to the draft time, Those are indicators that a player is probably not going to be ready for the start of the season. It's going to put them at a much higher re-injury risk. So the details of the injury are still a bit unknown. I will be filming with Dr. Morse again sometime this weekend. So we will talk about Kenyon Drake. Hopefully he knows more about it and can speak on the situation. But the fact that they're telling you it's not day-to-day or he'll be back soon or, you know, if it was a regular season, he'd be able to suit up. They're telling you it's going to take a while to heal, which means it's going to take more than a while to heal in my doctorate opinion. But regardless, I mean... The Dolphins say that they're hopeful he could play in week one. So that means, like, if they're not saying he's definitely going to be ready for week one, he probably won't be ready for week one. Kalen Kalen Balazs, on the other hand, did not even suit up in week two of preseason, which tells you that they're getting ready to give him a big workload. If Drake was healthy, absolutely, yes. He is by far the most talented running back in the backfield. But that's not what what matters in fantasy all the time. It's not just straight talent is going to get the opportunity because we've seen that's not the case with what Drake was for the first three, four years of his NFL career. He is the same back that he was at Alabama, someone that didn't get a workhorse role. I don't care who was ahead of him. I don't care who was behind him. I don't care what the coaching tendencies were. Running backs that are good, that command the workload, will get that workload. He never did that at Alabama, and he has translated that into the NFL. Is he ridiculously talented and efficient on a small sample size or on a small workload? Yes. Can we reasonably predict that he's going to get a larger workload in Miami this year? Probably not. This is such, you really need to talk yourself into, like you need to be enamored by his talent in order to actually want to draft him this year. With the walking boot and with the situation that he's in, Miami should be one of the, if not the single worst teams in the NFL this year. They have a horrible offensive line. Again, we don't even know who their quarterback is. They're also in a quarterback battle between Ryan Fitzpatrick and Josh Rosen, neither of which are going to be good quarterbacks for this team behind a bad offensive line. Their defense led up the fourth most yards per game last year, the sixth most points per game last year, the ninth most plays per game last year. So they're not going to have the ball that often. This is just an awful situation. So even if Drake, there's so many loopholes he needs to get through in order for him to somehow return value in fantasy this year, even if he becomes 100% before week one, which isn't going to happen, and then they name him the clear-cut starter and he's taking 75% of the touches, which also isn't going to happen because Kalen Balazs is going to take 50% of the touches, then you need his offense to somehow be okay and that give him enough opportunities. And Like, it's, there's just no way Kenyon Drake anywhere near his current, like, fifth or sixth round price is going to return value. He is off my board until the double digit rounds. I'm probably just staying away altogether. So if you want the entirety of all the guys that I'm staying away from, running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, tight ends, again, along with like the sleepers, my big board, positional rankings broken down by tiers, PPR, standard, half PPR, the big dogs Bible, which is a monster strategy piece that I put out, um, how to attack your fantasy football draft, as well as 
a preseason recap write up on personnel usage after each preseason week. That is all in the draft guide. So head over to bigdogsdraftguide.com. Cop it now. It is the only thing you need for your fantasy football draft, whether you like drafting on your laptop, your phone, your fucking tablet. It doesn't matter. It's accessible everywhere. It's the best piece of merchandise you could buy for this year's season 2019 fantasy football. Bigdogsdraftguide.com. Next guy up on this list, we have Darius Geis of the Washington Redskins. He is still going within the top 35 running backs. He's running back 35 right now off the board, 80th overall. This knee, man, do not believe Twitter clips. If there's one thing that I could tell you, don't believe Twitter clips, don't believe Instagram clips. They do not matter. Geis is a huge injury risk. If they actually progress him correctly to reserve him from getting injured again, that means he's getting nowhere near a full workload. You know, every report is basically saying from every doctor that I've talked to, Dr. Morse, the pro football doc, like anyone on Twitter that's actually a doctor, the people that work for Inside Injuries, they're all like 2019 is not Geis's year. 2020? Sure, but not 2019. He's going to share the workload with Adrian Peterson. They're both going to give up passing down work to Chris Thompson. The Redskins might, again, like all of these teams, might just be a shit show. They're likely going to start Case Keenum, who will eventually give that role up to Dwayne Haskins. Dwayne Haskins does not look like he's ready to be a good NFL quarterback yet. He's looked terrible in the preseason. Doesn't mean he can't be good this year, of course, but at best, he's going to be like an average, probably below average quarterback for his rookie season. This is a team that, like Miami, will compete for the number one overall pick in next year's draft. At best, you're getting a two-down grinder with talent. Yes, I loved him as a prospect as much as anyone, but for 2019, you have to look at it objectively. You're getting a two-down grinder in an offense and maybe the goal line back, but maybe Adrian Peterson that might get the goal line work, that won't get pass catching work in a horrible offense. He's an easy pass in 2019 season-long drafts. And we're starting to see a trend here, guys. Running backs on bad teams that are injured going into the year that are in committees, that don't get the pass-catching role, it's very easy to avoid these landmines. So stop drafting these guys when we see what's coming. Another one that's easy to see coming is Ronald Jones of the Tampa Bay Bucks. Now, I want to preface this by saying I am filming this on Wednesday afternoon. So preseason week three is obviously the most telling game of the preseason for most NFL teams because it is the dress rehearsal. So I have not watched. By the time you watch this on Saturday, I have not watched Thursday or Friday night's game. So obviously things can change. Um, And I'm kind of upset that the Ronald Jones knee swelling reports just came out because he was on this list prior to hearing any of that. But that's just another fucking negative to add to Ronald Jones' outlook this year. He is still going recently high. He's still a top 100 pick and he should not be. At this point, I shouldn't even have to tell you that the Ronald Jones breakout just ain't happening, Young Kings. Like, at least Ronald Jones is splitting snaps this year with Peyton Barber in the preseason pretty, like, 50-50. By this time last year, he was almost completely phased out of the Bucks' offense. And sure, the, the buzz all offseason has been great about Ronald Jones, but you can't name a single running back on this Bucks roster that Bruce Arians has not gone out of his way for to hype up and name the greatest single running back in the history of the NFL. From Peyton Barber to Ronald Jones to Andre Ellington to fucking Bruce A- Anderson to most recently as of this week, I don't even know how to say his name, Dare, Dare, Agon, Bau- oh my God, this is fucking embarrassing. Agon Buale. I'm so sorry for anyone that I just disrespected to a high degree. Um, Point being, the Ronald Jones hype really takes a backseat when every single running back on this roster is also getting a ton of hype from Bruce Arians. This is an offense that is not going to favor Ronald Jones at all, not going to favor his skill set, even if he does somehow become the number one here, which is very unlikely. Now he's dealing with the knee swelling, which is going to put him back. When you're in a running back by committee, you need to be out there for every snap, every practice rep, every preseason touch that you can get. You need to earn your way to a bigger workload, and this is not how you do it. Tampa Bay, their offensive line ranked 31st in run blocking per football outsiders last year, 28th per PFF. They are not going to be that much improved this year. This defense is going to be trash again, which means less time of possession, more throwing the ball, which is definitely not Rojo's strong suit. Again, don't fucking subjectively tell me that he's a good pass catcher like Derrick Henry. He caught a, a total of 32 passes in 40 college games last year, just as bad as Derrick Henry. He had nine targets all of last season, and he dropped two of those nine targets. He's not a pass catcher. That's not going to be his role in this backfield. They signed Andre Ellington for a reason. Maybe he'll get cut, but Ronald Jones is not going to be the pass catcher here. Through two preseason games, Peyton Barber, has been the starter in both, has ripped off the first five snaps in the first one, or the first seven in the first game, I believe the first five in the second one. Peyton Barber overall has seen 13 snaps with the one compared to Ronald Jones's nine, so you can clearly see who they favor. This might be a running back by committee, sure. Barber has been one of the most involved, Barber has been so far the most involved running back of this committee when they're in the red zone, when they're in the 10 zone, when they're near the goal line. And even if you don't think Peyton Barber is good, which a lot of people don't, or that he's going to be the guy for the entirety of the season, there will never be at any point where Ronald Jones is owning this backfield completely. 
I feel like people really have this misguided hypothetical upside for Ronald Jones that's just not there. Like, him getting 80% of the touches in this backfield will never happen. The upside for Ronald Jones, like, the best case scenario is that he beats out Peyton Barber, which is clearly not happening, um, and he takes, like, 60%. In the 60-40 split, he is the 60. That is the best case scenario for Ronald Jones. We look back at last year, and that split really didn't do anything for anyone. So, Ronald Jones is an easy fade for me, and if you think this offense is going to be good, at least give me the guy who's getting the goal line carries. And that is the 225-pound Peyton Barber, who tied for the seventh most 10-zone carries last year and the seventh most carries inside the five-yard line in the NFL among running backs last year. So there is no part of me that wants any part of Ronald Jones. So please avoid him. If you are enjoying this video, if you're enjoying the big facts, if you're enjoying the breakdowns, all I ask is that you scroll down. It takes five seconds out of your day. lets me know that you appreciate it. Hit the thumbs up button, please. Subscribe to the channel if you're new because we're going to be doing breakdowns like this every single day. Five videos a week. We're really out here grinding. We're out here eating, baby. Let's talk about some honorable mentions. We have three pass catching backs. We have Tariq Cohen, James White, and Naeem Hines. Now, Tariq Cohen, love him as a player. Explosive, really fun to watch. But there are already, I mean, this was something I talked about like a month or two ago where David Montgomery and Mike Davis have a much better skill set than what Jordan Howard offered last year from the pass catching role. And we're going to see Tariq Cohen's uh, Tariq Cohen's playing time come down, his reception total come down, and that was just um, a you know an observation from me that I thought it was an opinion for me. Now they're literally coming out and saying that they're going to see a reduced role for Terry Cohen this year, and it's like Matt Nagy literally came out and said that he's he probably handled too many touches last year, and that's like you know obviously it's coach speak, but it, it it's never really coach speak when it's from a negative thing, right? That tells you where he sees the guy. If it's a positive thing, you can be like, okay, yeah, they say that about everyone. But when it's a negative thing, that's not good. Um, he could have easily came out and said, well, Terry Cohen's a really explosive playmaker, and you want to get a guy like that the ball in space as often as you possibly can. Like, that would have been great. Boom. Done. But instead, he's like, yeah, we probably gave it to him too much. So that alone just tells you that he handled the ball too much. Montgomery and Mike Davis are both going to eat into his workload for passing. So Terry Cohen, outside of a full PPR, is I'm not drafting him anywhere near his ADP. Same with James White. I like James White. Obviously, like the offense, very heavily involved. Most of the damage he did last year were in games where both Sony Michelle and Rex Burkhead were off the field. This year, that probably won't be the case. Now they drafted Damian Harris, who is also a pass catching back. Um, I mean, they brought in Nikhil Harry. They'll have Julian Edelman healthy, who they didn't have for four games. Um, Josh Gordon, I don't know if he's going to play at all, but if he does, that's another red flag for him. Um, James White, nowhere near his ADP do I want him in any non full PPR leagues. If it's full PPR, I don't know, sixth, seventh round, I'll start looking at him, but I'm not excited about him because the opportunity cost with these guys is just that. Like, you never know when to play them. So it's not just like you can look at the overall numbers at the end of the year. You also have to account for the fact that they're going to put up dud games in your lineup. And then when you want to start them, it's hard to start them, right? A lot of times you're going to sit them for their big game. So it's a lot more than just overall numbers at the end of the year. So I'm off those guys. Naeem Hines as well. He has taken one of the 19 first team snaps so far for the Colts this year. Marlon Mack has taken 18 of the 19. Naeem Hines has not been playing on third downs. Marlon Mack has been, which is huge. Naeem Hines last year really only put up numbers when Marlon Mack was hurt. In the four games that he missed, that is when Naeem Hines ate. In the playoff games last year, Naeem Hines had zero targets, zero receptions. Marlon Mack had four targets, two receptions. Naeem Hines is a guy I want absolutely no part of. There's, I don't see any upside. I don't see any reason to have buzz for Naeem Hines. Also, this should go without saying, but Carlos Hyde, every single projection is basically leaving him off the roster. Don't draft Carlos Hyde. Carlos Hyde is not like the backup, the handcuff to Damian Williams. Um, I like Darwin Thompson more than... Carlos Hyde for sure. And I, you know what? I, I'm sick of people coming at me like, oh, Darwin Thompson, Darwin Thompson, Darwin Thompson. All of the reports that Andy Reid came out and, and was sent, like all offseason we heard Damian Williams was the guy, Damian Williams is the guy, Damian Williams is the guy, pulls his hamstring and then the other guys get work with the ones, they get work in the preseason. People are like, oh, Darwin Thompson looks good. Bro, this, I wrote this back in April before the draft even happened. This was, you know, I, I did a full write-up on all of the rookie running backs, but this was a small part of it. Best team fit analysis for Darwin Thompson, the Kansas City Chiefs. His ceiling would be like being Tyreek Cohen in the Chiefs offense. Player comp, Tyreek Cohen, draft spot projection, sixth round projected landing spot, Kansas City Chiefs. I fucking called Darwin Thompson's landing spot to the exact pick. The round, the team, the pick. I was as high on Darwin Thompson as fucking anybody in the draft. So please don't at me about Darwin Thompson. All right, I'm done. I like Damian Williams. Damian Williams is not off my draft board. I like the fact that his ADP is falling further and further because people are believing in the fake news. It was all motivation from Andy Reid to get Damian Williams hyped up. And now he's running exclusively with the ones as I expected. 
So Damian Williams is not on, on this list. Carlos Hyde is on this list. The last guy on this list would be Lamar Miller. He was barely usable last year. Yeah, his end of season numbers were great. He had like four good games, but bringing in Duke Johnson, Duke Johnson is way more of a competition to Lamar Miller than Alfred Blue ever was. Duke Johnson is going to take the pass catching role there. He'll probably take some of the rushing workload. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if Demario Crockett takes the goal line work now. You're left with like Lamar, Lamar Miller inside the 20 cat like he'll end up with 160 carries that were inside the 20s he probably won't get goal line work he won't get pass catching work that is almost the most useless use of volume that you could possibly have for a fantasy running back so he's still going like the seventh or eighth round i want nothing to do with lamar miller this year fade his ass fade everybody on this list and you will be looking pretty for your 2019 fantasy football season that's all i got for y'all today again hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video subscribe to the channel if you're new a rating interview on itunes would be very much appreciated go check out teamstake.com Go have your league, buy in on teamstake.com. Use the draft guide to help you win your draft. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. That's it for today. I love y'all. I'm out. Peace.